Welcome. I'm Alan. I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Uh, so it's our October meetup. Quite a good turnout this uh, this week. Our sponsors uh, today are Zonar Systems. We're in their office. Thank you so much, Zonar, for having us out here. And before we do much else, I'm going to let uh, Jesse Young, the VP of Technology from Zonar, uh, talk a little bit about what Zonar does. Can everyone hear me? Because I really hate mics. <laughs> I really hate Mike. So thank you everyone for coming out. Thanks to Alan and Dawn for uh, putting this all together. I guess you guys just hit a year, year anniversary a month ago. So this is uh, this is huge. This is awesome. Um, also want to give a quick thank out to uh, thank you out to Eric Purser, a Zonar employee that's been a puppy member and really uh, uh, hooked us up with doing this. There he is. So thank you, Eric. <laughs> So, uh, welcome everyone to the Zonar space. We've been here for two months. This is our technical development center where a uh, company's been around for about 14 years here in the Seattle area. Headquarters is down in Tequila, Ken. We're about 300 people right now, quickly growing. Um, we knew that we needed a, a, a nice place for development to happen, a little bit away from the business, um, and a central location where developers like to work. And we found that downtown was a perfect place. Pioneer Square is great for that. Uh, lots of commu commuting options and, what, uh, and all that. So a quick, uh, a lot of people are probably confused about what Zonar does. We've kind of been a little quiet around the area, especially for 14 years, which is a good thing, I think. Um, we're a hardware-enabled software as a service company for heavy, fleet, heavy fleets. What that really means is we've created a G uh, safety inspection system and a GPS tracking system for heavy fleet vehicles. That's your school buses, public transportation, over the road truck haulers, uh, the kind of the gambit. We've also got an Android tablet where we're offering hours of service, navigation, two-way messaging to all these over the road truck haulers, uh, school bus operators, operators, et cetera. So we're doing a, a lot of cool stuff, um, definitely big data. Some of the, the core technologies we're using are definitely Python. We've been using Python for the last seven or eight years. A lot of our middleware stacks uh, doing Python. We've got a lot of PHP uh, backend database systems. We're predominantly with uh, running Postgres with the PostGIS uh, extension, which gives us that geospatial capability. Uh, we use some Cassandra. Been digging into that for the last three or four years, uh, and really always taking a look at the newest technologies and how we can help them uh, or utilize them and, and uh, get people like you to, to help us out and create new technologies. Uh, Quick, quick update, we are hiring, like any other tech company. Uh, where's Nick Johnson? Nick over here he is looking for Python developers right now. So you know, if you're interested afterwards, talk to Nick. Uh, he's doing some cool stuff where we're uh, sending data over to Daimler Trucks North America. Uh, uh, some of you guys might have read that we took a, a minority investment from those guys a couple months back. We're really excited about that. Really fun stuff that we're doing there. Uh, we've got, I don't think Jack's here, but we've got some uh, front-end developer positions open as well. Always looking for big data tech people um, at the same time. So thank you again for, for coming out. And uh, again, thank you to Don and Alan for letting us host this time. Thank you. Ready? All right, we'll uh, start the first talk. It's uh, Maxim. Oh. <laughs> I forgot. He's talking about, uh, he's doing a tech travel report. Uh, his company is called RuneStorm. Uh, they're a startup out of I don't know, Silicon Valley. All right, where they all are. <laughs> Other than Seattle, of course. Uh, uh, so, yeah, without further ado, thanks. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you once again for this opportunity and for having me here. Um, so as Alan said, we're Runstorm. Um, we started this company um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and um, I guess I'll describe what we're doing right now and then go uh, a little bit into the history. Uh, so what we're doing right now, Runstorm is a travel technology company. We're helping airlines with a very niche problem. Uh, we're helping them with uh, distressed passengers uh, so when, whenever there's a canceled or delayed flight uh, and they need like 200 rooms right now, we're helping them. So basically we're preventing... Preventing 
preventing this. <laughs> so uh, you will be surprised, maybe this kind of situation happened to you, but it happens very often and whenever it happens, uh, airline and hotel industry also, they're notorious lead data, it's very hard for them to manage this type of situation. Usually they just pick up the phone and call around, call the hotels, call whatever company they work with, uh, probably to a huge call center and it takes time and it's very painful for the passenger as well. Um, how did we get into this space at all? So we started this company. Um, yeah. So <laughs> WalkSource was the name of our, of our company. Uh, a few years ago, we started looking into a problem of relocations, uh, which is basically the same problem, but with hotels. So you know how hotels overbook all the time. So if you have a hotel with 100 rooms. Every day you try and sell 110. You know that 10 people are not going to show up, uh, historically. But then people show up and you're like, damn. And uh, you try to find rooms and uh, again, it's hard to pick up the phone, you call the hotels around you and it's hard to do this. So what we've seen uh, in our system is one person was relocated 40 miles from San Jose to San Francisco and the hotel paid $900 for that room and paid about $200 uh, for the cab ride. So th that problem is crazy also. And hotels, they don't have any technology solutions for this type of problem, none, zero. So we're the first uh, solution to that problem. So hotels can go to that platform, we still have this product up and running. Um, so with this product, we got into, okay, I'll try and click just one slide. <sighs> yes. <laughs> um, with this product uh, that uh, is called WalkStars, we got into YC, and it's been an amazing experience, and of course, we'll have maybe a couple minutes uh, for questions afterwards, and I'll be happy to answer you know, all your questions about YC, how to get there, what to do there, what not to do there. Um, but overall, it's been a great experience, and uh, what YC helps you with is they basically put a brand on your startup, and it's much easier after that to raise money, to talk to people. So yeah, it's been a great experience. Uh, so we started with that problem. Uh, we started working with hotels. Um, we onboarded about 250 hotels in the Bay Area, which is a really big number. Um, and then we realized that basically we're trying to work with people like this. So they absolutely don't like technology, they are scared of technology, and um, it's very hard to work with them. So we, uh, the problem is we were working directly with hotels, we were sending them emails, and people, front desk people at the hotel, they're not incentivized at all to resolve those situations that I described because they're not paid for it. It's like, 11 p.m. and why would I be doing this? Why would I be going on that platform, uploading my availability? And the problem is we cannot connect. It's very hard to connect to their inventory. And uh, even if we connected uh, to their property management system um, where they have you know, names of guests and how many rooms are there and how much are those rooms, um, that data in, in that system is often inaccurate. Uh, so yeah, those people, from those people, they just game the system. They say, um, yeah, I have these 10 rooms here, but I hope that I'm going to sell them tonight for a better price, so I'll just put them aside. And you know, those 10 rooms are gone from the market, basically. Um, hotel tech ecosystem looks like this. So this is how many steps, uh, how many hops the information from the hotel has to take in order to propagate to the guest. So the anecdotal absolutely situation is you're a hotel, you have rooms available on let's say booking.com and you're trying to close that channel and uh, again, you know, we were joking with uh, John just a few minutes ago that some of those systems are still run on COBOL, for example. It's not a joke, it's true. It's true. 
And because of that, you're a hotel, you're trying to close one of your channels because you're looking at your property management system and you say, oh, I no longer have rooms. Um, so sometimes it takes up to 30 minutes for booking.com to remove your rooms from the market. So, you know, guys, this is, this is 2015, come on, right? Um, so this is how it looks like, and that's why one of the reasons why I have this over here. Um, just trying to understand what my next slide there is. Right, so yes, my next slide is what? <laughs> um, they also use this machine sometimes. We would call them and you know arrange everything and pamper them, and then they would say, "Hey, fax us your email." So this is hotels, so that's you know, a lot of fun. Um, so then we realized we don't want to deal with hotels, like there's just too many of them and we have to work directly with them, we cannot tap into their property management systems. How about we go some other way? So we started thinking about working with airlines and uh, well, we've got a few connections in airlines. Uh, our, one of our customers right now is Virgin America and we have a bunch of other airlines in the pipeline. Uh, so we we're working with Virgin America, and but at the time we started looking at that space, and we're like, it's easier to talk to just one airline than to a thousand hotels. It's great. And recently, I've been going to a bunch of conferences. That, that worked out. That's that's good, right? Um, so recently, I've been going to a bunch of conferences, trying to get contacts at um, all kinds of airlines, and. Um, from the stage, they, they talk about how they build new great things, how they have iPhone apps and, and everything. So each person that got on stage um, at, at a conference a few weeks ago, um, airline person, oh, we built this great iPhone app that you can use. There is a map of, of our hub airport. You know, there's all sorts of things there. You can check on, you can check in online and everything. Airport people got on stage and they they say we built this amazing iPhone app for our airport and you, you have a map there and you have everything you, you know you can find a coffee shop and everything and like I'm using maybe five different airlines and I'm flying to 15 different airports and, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, this yeah. is what I need to have on my phone to in order to you know enjoy all this progress. Uh, never going to happen. And I was proposing to them, I was uh, talking to all kinds of airline and airport people, and uh, if there was one open standard, I was saying, uh, data exchange standard between airlines and airports and, and passengers, and people like like you, like me, uh, you know, iOS developers would be building those applications for free, and you would have you know five different applications that would compete with each other, and you would choose the best that could, the best app that could tap into, you know, all the airlines and airports. But anyway, I'm to a little bit. Um, I have my notes here. So um, yeah, the, the fundamental the fundamental problem. Um, is that there is you know separation between you know mere mortals us and I don't know if it's relevant but you know the travel industry um, and fundamentally the problem is that there is no master plan for travel nobody thought about it um, technologies were and all those systems that I showed you on the previous slide you know all those different systems were evolving kind of naturally, and, and that's great up to a certain point. Um, but right now, and the again, the travel industry people are complaining about it. So they are saying that you know the development is siloed, systems do not talk to each other, and they want to change it. But they're really struggling. So I'm talking to there are a few standard bodies in the travel industry. One of them is IATA, 
uh, which is a standard body for air travel. Uh, another is APEX, which is, I don't know why, but also a standard body for air travel. And I was talking to the CEO of uh, APEX, and he was saying, oh yeah, we would love to develop those standards, uh, you know, because yes, we have to do it. Um, but the problem is that he was talking about it in the context of, you know, we will create the standards. This is our standards. We're not going to, you know, let anybody touch those standards. And that's that's I think the fundamental problem that they're they're not collaborating on those standards. They're not collaborating on those new things. And it's very very hard to innovate in this space uh, because of that. So. As an example, you know, this is the open source principles. You go to open source.gov, uh, sorry. Um, and those are, you know, really great principles. We all use them. We all contribute to open source projects. I'm an engineer, by the way. I'm not, I'm not a manager. Um, um, yeah, so, of course, it's better to participate, to talk about problems, to, to iterate. Um, rapidly to, you know, choose to let people who are able to contribute to, to the product and to have this community around them, you know, this is how open source uh, projects thrive, right? So this is an example of principles of a new, newly created standard for uh, passenger and airport data interchange standards. Um, these are the principles. It is governed by Passenger Services Conference Resolution 783. What the hell is that, right? Um, um, yes, they do collaborate electronically. Why a private site that you don't have access to? Um, and of course, they review those standards twice a year. That's the, the complete opposite uh, of you know standards of open innovation, open source kind of um, innovation. So that's the fundamental problem, I think, um, in travel. The, why is it hard to innovate in travel? Because of that. Because all that development is closed. Um, and what I'm proposing and I'm talking to, as I said, to people from IATA, not me, but our company, and a lot of other companies as well. We're talking to people from IATA, to people from Apex, and we're trying to convince them to uh, make those projects, that those standards that they're working on, more open. Um, and I'm going to meet with all those guys um, very soon. So that's the current situation, and we're just trying to do this. Um, this is it. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time for a few questions, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah, great. Anybody? Oh. So what do you use Python for? So what do you use Python for? <laughs> great question. <laughs> Um, our backend um, is built entirely in Python, so we have a backend and a frontend. And what we're trying to do we're, we're, with Python, we're trying to build that one database for all the data sources that we have. So we have to consolidate and normalize the data from all different sources, from all those different room suppliers that we have, and uh, present it via this one standardized API. That's why we're using Python. On the front end, we're using Clojure and React. Um, that is compiled to JavaScript, of course. Somebody else? You subscribe to the Spark ecosystem? Oh, uh, say again? Spark? Spark? Yeah. No, there are many different players, and right now we're working with a company called Hotel Beds, Torico, and Sabre. Um, I believe that is a great company that you're mentioning, but you know we have a bunch of other companies in the pipeline to integrate with. Is Saber the one that Google bought? No. Google, Google bought one of the uh, companies. So of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Actually, uh, for everybody, how
How many people are familiar with Y Combinator? Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Do you, so you guys have any questions? You know, Maxim is, Max is pretty humble about that, but um, at this point, I think Y Combinator is more selective than Harvard by at least an order of magnitude. What's your background? Uh, my background is software engineering. Actually, um, I'm a lawyer by um, training, but I've been doing software engineering front end for a long, long time, for <laughs> over 12 years. So, uh, we touched on this a little when I was talking to you earlier um, about the types of questions. If you get accepted for an interview uh, with Y Combinator, um, what kind of questions do they ask you? numbers and you know, where do you think uh, the company can be at a certain point. Is there any other uh, questions that uh, we can kind of prepare for if any of us apply to get accepted? So the question is, the question is about Y Combinator and their selection process. Uh, when you submit your application, the first stage, or that's the first stage, the second stage, uh, they invite you for an interview and it happens to a very, very small percentage of all the companies, of all the applications. Uh, at that interview, they're going to ask you for your team, your total addressable market, your growth. If you have revenue, great. If, it's very hard, actually, to get into YC if you don't have a working prototype already or some sort of product. A lot of companies from, from a previous batch were accepted because they have, like, millions of dollars of revenue per month already. So it's very hard to, to get there. And people are complaining that YC is becoming a little bit, you know, it's, it, they're playing a little bit too safe. So they're, they're accepting companies that already have revenue, so they're not investing into this crazy ideas that people are creating. But they're, I think they're trying to take a step back and uh, to invest in those more risky um, ventures. Um, but still, yeah, probably going to be very hard if you don't have a working prototype or some sort of product. If you have crazy growth, if you have revenue, it's good for you, and you probably will be accepted. Back to your brainstorm project. Uh, I know that in other industries, we have data exchange standards like uh, EDI versus XML, things like that. It sounds to me like you guys are still working on what the data model itself is going to look Yes, that's correct. So you don't even, you're not even at the point where you're trying to get these systems to talk via some common... Absolutely not. And again, we're not in position to create those standards. We're a small startup, and if we try to, you know, I don't know, kill that behemoth, it's, we're going to die, right? So we're trying to facilitate the conversation because it's one of our pain points. I want to work directly with hotels. Why am I going through all those hops and adding, you know, each hop adds dollars to the final premise, right? Why do I want to do that? Um, so we're just trying to start a conversation about that and um, um, talk to airline people as well about their problems. Um, what was the first part of your uh, question? I was talking about data exchange methods like EDI versus XML. Oh, right, right. A lot of people like in, that have inventories or they're controlling inventories, they're invested in EDI because their customers are. Um, there's no real good reason for using EDI other than this is the standard and this is the way it is, you know. So in a sense, it, so you're right that for those big companies, it doesn't make a lot of sense, for example, for Sabre to try to comply with some sort of open standard, global standard, right? Because they're locking down their customers, but it's good for us. And that's why we need to start that conversation. It's good for me, it's good for you as a traveler because the prices will go down, the, because the competition is going to go up. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you could talk more about your technology side and the personal thing. So you mentioned Python on the back end. Is it Python Django, Rest Framework, Class? Uh, can you talk more about that? Right. You said Closure Script and React on the front. And I wonder if you have uh, so the question was about our technology stack. Um, it's Python and Django and REST uh, framework on the back end. Uh, we do have a, 
it's kind of sad that we siloed our development, but but not really. Our engineers communicate every day um, because you, you know at the end of the day they just need to create this one channel between the back end and front end um, so they communicate well. And yeah, on the front end we're using Clojure uh, that is compiled to JavaScript using and we're using React Facebook framework um, on the front end. Several things. I've been in the recent few months I've been moving farther away from the development because I took over the CEO role just a few months ago. And uh, my CTO or our CTO will be able to answer your questions in detail, what kind of framework, what kind of libraries we're using. Feel free to reach out. Okay, Jacob's here. He is not here, he is in California right now. Right. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a quick, like, 15-ish minute break, uh, and then when we come back, we'll do some lightning talks, and then we'll have uh, one more speaker, and then uh, we'll call it a night. All right. <laughs> I'm going to try and get as much feedback as possible yeah, and stand to... right here. So, um, uh, yeah. you know, I'm going to stay near the volume now. I'm just going to maybe use this. See if this this works. Yeah, hit the mute thing. Uh, no, it's in the middle. You're the AV guy. I don't know. Does anyone here understand technology? No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is working. Yeah, that works. Oh, yeah, you're not, yeah, no feedback. No feedback yet. Yeah. Move around with yeah, it. See what happens. All right. Now one-handed programming. Wait, I need my cider before you start. All right, thank you. All right, yeah, so what I want to talk just briefly about is Talks, which is this awesome tool to let you kind of automate some of your testing and uh, manage your virtual environments, stuff like that, because everybody is working on making their stuff work on Python 3 now, right? Yeah? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, but then they still need to make sure it works on Python 2.7. So uh, this helps manage that mess. Um, and then PyTest, which is a test framework that people have started to use more and more. Um, traditional people have probably been using unit test, um, which is a little bit annoying. It creates a lot of boilerplate and a bunch of other stuff that nobody wants to deal with, um, which they're supposed to be fixing in something called unit test 2, um, rather than just you know, fixing things. So I'm a big advocate of PyTest. I have a really dumb module that I created to demo this stuff. It is uh, not a good representation of anything that you might want to do, but there's tests attached to it, and uh, it's all set up here. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is go into my, well, we'll take a quick look at the module. Um, so uh, my stuff is the module. Uh, there is a inside of here. We have this wonderful class called basket, and we can put things inside of the basket. We can find all the colors of the things inside the basket, and we can find unique items in the basket. We can also describe the basket. Note here, we are using the old syntax for print. This will cause issues later. Then we are going to go in to take a look at some, oops, sorry. Because we're writing a little Python module here, we also made sure we wrote a setup.py file that explains what we're doing and also makes it so that we can actually distribute this to other people to use and install correctly, and not just be a bunch of files. Um, so now moving into our test folder, I have a set of tests here. Um, so traditionally, your test might have looked something like this. We had to create a class that our test will be, a test case for it, and then create tests inside of that class. This is actually pretty simple, but normally, when you start actually doing interesting stuff with unit test, it gets to be even more of a mess, and everybody hates it. So this exact same set of tests. Oh, the other thing I want to say there. So we also have to now know all these different types of asserts that they have defined in there. 
which may or may not be pleasant for people. Uh, so now let's go look at the pi test equivalent of all of this. Ah, it's just two methods and very clear asserts at the bottom of them. We put an apple in the basket. We now look and see if apple is one of the unique items in the basket. Same thing for the colors. Um, so now, and so there's a bunch of other things you can do with PyTest. There's a bunch of really convenient things you can do with it to do interactive debugging of your tests when they fail. You can have it print out nice things about local variables where it failed. You can have it inject you into PyDB. Uh, the Python debugger also where the test failed. So it's really nice when things are actually going wrong to actually know what's going wrong besides this test failed. We now know about the circumstances around the test failure. Just, it's really nice. I really encourage people to check it out. The docs are actually really nice for it as well. Bunch of really helpful helpful things. Um, Flask even has some stuff for PyTest as well. Yeah. Um, I don't actually believe in this one I needed to even include PyTest. I imported it. I don't actually believe that I needed to um, do that piece of it. Sorry, I'm not in the right folder anymore. Um, I just usually end up doing that where I have, uh, sorry, one-handed here. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I could actually just delete that guy right there. What ends up happening is these are all prefixed with test. There's a few other prefixes that PyTest also knows to know this thing. The great thing is you can start using PyTest without actually removing unit tests. It understands unit tests. So we move back. I'm going to, oops. Um, I'm going to now transition over to talks really quick. And then as part of that, we'll get back into PyTest. But, yeah, so let me, um, let me just do a really quick thing on talks because it's actually going to run the tests, and then you'll see what happens with them. Okay, so is, is PyTest and PyTest? Uh, PyTest is completely separate. I mean, there may be some back-end pieces that are similar, but it's, it's a different p framework. It supports unit test tests. Um, as well as its own. But basically, it's going to look for those things, and as long as you set up an assert, it uses that as the, the test case. So if an exception gets raised, or well, an assert will raise an exception as well, um, that's the point where the test breaks. And if you're in an interactive mode or something like that, then it will actually drop you to a debugger there or show you what's going on there. Um, but there's a bunch of things that you can <coughs> import into it to actually get a better idea. There's a bunch of things like, say you're working with files and you want to mock those out. PyTest actually has some stuff to create virtual temporary files and manage that so that, say you have, a, say you have several tests running on the same machine, you don't want to just create your file in like, you know, slash temp slash something because then you'll have two tests colliding on that. So it has ways to create these kind of virtual files. There's a whole bunch of other things. I'm just like touching the surface of what it does. Whatever you, whatever you tell it to import, right? So whatever's in your test, it'll import that stuff. Um, it's just executing the Python file there. It's only going to import whatever it is that you tell it to import. So about uh, no. talks. Yes, yeah, so about talks. So I'm just going to, so basically, it's really easy. You set up talks.ini file. Um, we'll start at the very top here. We say talks, my environment list, the things I want to test it on. There's a whole bunch of predefined ones, but this is basically Python. 2.7. We're going to say we're going to create an environment for that. Um, our test environment, we're going to change into the test folder to run the tests. We're going to make sure we have PyTest installed, and then we're going to run PyTest. That's all this says. Um, I also have something here called PEP8, which is a special one that I've said, and I'm saying we're not going to actually change into the test directory. We're going to install Flake 8, we're going to run Flake 8, and then for Flake 8, I also have some properties that I've set up that things I don't want it to look into right now. Um, same thing with PyTest, you can create things there. So you set up this just like this. 
when I fire up Tox, so normally you probably used to create your own virtual environments and stuff like that that you work inside of. Tox is actually doing that for you. So I go Tox. We see right here it made um, this, uh, it made my module that I, the, the my stuff uh, module. It, uh, and this is where it ended up installing it. Uh, one of the things, also, you can actually set what your, your hash, you, um, your seed is, hash seed is. So if you want to actually make certain tests rely on random things to be <coughs> predictable, it can do that as well. Um, and then it ran PyTest. And you can see it ran the, the bucket test. It ran a test that will fail in Python 3. And it ran um, the unit test ones that we, we had there as well. So it was able to work through all those. Yes? So that's all I did, right there. I ran all my tests in Python 2.7. Now, I had mentioned that this is going to break. Oh, um, so say I wanted to run my PEP8 thing. I created that other environment. So I can go tox-e, PEP8. And there's a whole bunch of things in here that are going to be incorrect. Sorry, I should have bumped that up to the top again. So right here, we see things that are wrong. So like, I created this dictionary. I didn't put spaces in the correct places. We get down to this thing down here in the bottom where I have, um, there's some other white space issues, uh, things like that. So, you know, we all want to be moving towards PEP8 so our style is consistent, things like that. You can now wrap that all into your same uh, test setup. Also, I'd mentioned multiple test environments. So, go up here and say, okay, well now we want to make sure that this also builds against Pi 3.4. So I will just go like this, once again. Clear, whoops, sorry. I'll run talks again. Oh, and we got a whole bunch of things that it's upset about. Apparently this package is not happy with, so we go up here, we see that it still ran the Pi 2.7 stuff, everything was fine. It started to run, it was able to install in the Pi 3.4, but then it started failing. And that's because, remember that whole thing I said about print? Didn't wrap it correctly in the parentheses. It's unhappy about that and everywhere where things are imported on that, it's failing. I don't have 3.3, I don't have Python 3.3 installed on my machine. But I don't have that interpreter installed on my machine. So you still have to have that version of Python installed. It will create a virtual environment for that one and go out to pip and everything. One of the other things I really like about talks, it caches everything. So when it installed all these packages, it didn't actually have to go down and download everything again. Um, there's a bunch of other things, cool things you can do with Tox. Um, as part of my workflow, I have things so it actually will up, I can go Tox, specify an environment, and it will launch stuff up to, uh, it'll do the sdisk commands to send things up to the actual repository, you know, the, the PyPy repositories and all that kind of stuff. But this is like super, super, Overview of all of this. One more question. Yeah. So, um, Tox and uh, Python. They're completely separate, but they're they bridge really well. They're written by the same author. Yeah. So, uh, it was a lot to throw into one thing, but they're less interesting separate. Um, so, I highly the docs for both of them are amazing. I highly recommend. Well, the Tox docs maybe not as much, but uh, they're both pretty easy, especially to get started with. I highly recommend it. All the all the repos I have for my stuff at work are all wrapped up in Tox and PyTest. It just makes everything really easy. And with the continuous integration like Travis. And yeah, so um, Travis is a little wonky. There were some things to actually integrate with Tox better. And they were like, no, 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 we don't want to do that. That sounds complicated. <laughs> Much like everything Travis does. But yeah. Um, Anyway, you can still do it. Tox is just a command. You can have it sort all that stuff out. But getting the niceties of having it like tell you which builds it failed against, it's not going to be able to do that for you if you wrap that right into Tox. You might be able to do it if you did something where it inferred the version that Travis is trying to get you to build with and only ran that Tox environment. But I don't know what all their integrations are. Um, I use GitLab at work. And so I have GitLab CI stuff and work around that. So I have a workflow at work for that. But. Great.
Thank you. service-oriented architecture. I thought I'd front load all the jargon for this talk. Um, it's actually a lot simpler than that. So service-oriented architecture is basically microservices. Um, 
it, depending on how pedantic you want to get, it's the internet, it's web 2.0, it's REST APIs. So microservices, it's breaking software into small components, discrete components. Um, it's basically what we do with object-oriented programming. You know, we, we break functionality into classes. We have uh, interfaces that we use. Same thing, but at a software level. You can actually look at Unix as a service-oriented architecture. You've got a command line, and you exit, uh, execute a bunch of small programs that have one function. You take the input from the output from one, and you use it as the input for the next. Um, so connected via communications protocol. For example, in Unix, it would be pipes. Uh, but nowadays, we pretty much mean REST and HTTP. That is what pretty much everyone is talking about when they talk about microservices. The benefits uh, to doing something large monolithic software is it's easier to scale. Um, you can, by breaking it up into smaller pieces, you can divide it amongst larger groups. Um, if, if you need more resources on one component, you can add them um, easily and it doesn't affect the development of the rest of your component. So again, it allows independent development. You've got smaller teams, they're each working on their own thing, and as long as they provide an interface, an API, um, how they actually do things doesn't really matter, which is where you get to heterogeneous development. Um, I can do my service in Python, you can do your service in Java. Someone else can do their service in C. Um, but we use REST maybe more than we need to. And the reason I included um, service-oriented architecture in the title is that um, when we talk about REST, we think internet. Uh, when we talk about service-oriented architecture, we're thinking more internally. You've got a piece of software that you've broken up. Um, a lot of places, Amazon, Netflix, they all use a microservice architecture, F5, where I was from. Um, but a lot of those services are internal, and they're not actually exposed to an end user. And so there's really no reason to use the very heavy HTTP stack. Um, like Netflix is standardized, they have Nginx, so they're running Nginx. And then they've got a service that Nginx is directing to. And all of this is going over HTTP. Uh, and HTTP is a little unwieldy. It doesn't all map very well to long running tasks. If you've ever designed a REST API and you've had to do something that, that takes longer than 30 seconds, it's a pain in the butt because now you can't do it in one request. You've got to send a request to do a long running task and then you've got to continuously pull and pull and pull and wait until that task is done. Uh, you also, when you have an API, a REST API, it's very difficult to break that up into even smaller pieces. Um, to do that, you have to, you know, for example, with Nginx, redirect each URL to some different piece of software. Uh, generally, you know, you'd have like a, a Flask server um, providing a REST API. Well, if you want to have, you know, the delete portion of that API handled by a different piece of software, it's a pain in the butt. You've got to now kind of proxy through your Flask service. Um, and HTTP is unreliable. If it's an internal service, you generally, I mean, you're, you're going over one switch. So you can count on it being fairly reliable. But you can't really count on that. So usually you have to account for failures, you have to retry, usually you have some kind of a loop. It's, it's a pain in the butt. Um, so here, here's an example of like a, uh, an actual internal API that you might have. Um, we had something like this at F5, it's you, you want to test. You want to test uh, your software against kind of you know, a production environment. So you have a test harness. Uh, and so you, you want automated testing, so you create an API for that. So to create a harness, you might do something like this. You post to a server slash harnesses, and you give it some data, like the, the test template to use and then what test suites you want, want to run on it. And you would get back, you know, like a harness ID, for example. Sorry. Um, now, that process of setting, you know, let's say it's got to create a Docker instance, it's got to configure a bunch of things, it's got to configure networks, set that up, that's going to take a while. So what you'll do is you'll, 
try to get the status of that harness ID that was sent back to you. So you have like slash harnesses, slash, and the ID, ID we got packed was 45. So we're just gonna pull on that and wait for a status. And for example, until you've got a status ready. And then to delete that harness, when we're done testing with it, you would send a delete and you would send that to the harnesses and that harness ID. Um, and that, that works okay, but that's, it's a lot of overhead for an internal service. And, and this is something you would probably run, you know, a hundred times a day maybe. It's, it's not something that has high volume, but it's still kind of an unwieldy way to do this. So it turns out you could actually do something simpler. Use Redis. Uh, how many people have used Redis to interactive? Okay, now put your hands down, oh, let's see, keep your hands up if you've used it for something other than a key value store, other than a caching layer. So we got a couple people. Okay, well then this, this will be interesting to the rest of you. Uh, so instead of having our HTTP REST layer, what we can actually do is just use Redis uh, queues. Redis. Redis is, is not just a Q value store, it's actually a data structure server. So everyone is you know, familiar with uh, the key value store, you know, the kind of replica of memcached, but it actually has a lot of other data structures that you can use. Um, and so one way that we can replace our REST service is to, to use the Redis list as queues. And so there's two commands that you have to, you have to know for this, L push. And that's going to push a value, you know, whatever request you're trying to make, onto the left side of a list. And then BR pop. There's an R pop, which will take a value from the right side of the list, but the B is blocking. So what happens is uh, your server can call the BR pop command, and it'll just sit there and it'll wait. It'll wait for a request to come in. And as soon as one comes in, it pops it out and it starts working on it. <coughs> And so to replicate this REST API that we had, of creating a harness, getting a harness, deleting a harness, what you can do is you can just create a different Redis list for each of those operations. So you might use a key of harness create, harness status, harness delete. And so let's see what that would look like. So if you want to implement that on your client, so one thing here is this is where this is where the requests come in. This is like making you know uh, an HTTP call on a server, uh, but getting the result back, you you have to have a, a unique location that those results come back to. So let's say we had had a client. We want to implement that REST API using Redis, and so um, what we're going to do is I've, I've kind of moved these out of order. But you know, you've, you've got your Redis host, you've got you know, some, some constants to represent <coughs> those keys that you've created for the different operations. And so what we're gonna do is just create a helper, faction, uh, helper function. And it's gonna take the operation that you wanna do, the key, and whatever data you need to pass into it, uh, and it's going to convert that to JSON. So there's something universal anyone can, can access. It's going to push that into that queue, which if we're trying to create, we'd be passing in harness create. And then here's, here's the trick is, so where do you go to get that result? Well, what we can do is we can just hash the key and the data that we passed in, and that'll give us a location to wait. And so, so what the client does is it pushes this request into that queue, and then it just starts waiting. And it doesn't have to worry about whether this queue is there, you know, what, what's going on with that. It just immediately goes to um, waiting for something to appear in that queue. If that queue doesn't exist, Redis just creates it. It handles it for you. You don't have to do anything else. Uh, so we're going to get back the payload that was put in there, and we're just going to convert that back to a, a Python data structure. And this is this get result key. This is where it just hashes it out. Uh, and so then our API that we're using in our client actually just looks like this. To create a harness, we call our harness API with that key, which is just a string pointing to a Redis list. And we pass in, we set the value to the data that we need to pass in. To get the status, 
we would just pass in. So when we get a return value, it's gonna have a harness ID. So we just pass in the, the ID, of that, ID of that harness, and now we get back a status. And same with deleting. And so how, how do you implement this on the server? Uh, it's actually very simple. So this is gonna be the same thing that hashes gives us a unique identifier for the return result. Uh, and then this is all you have to, you're basically doing the exact same thing in, in reverse. You're just waiting for something to get added to that queue. And, and then you're, you're doing, you know, whatever functionality here in line 17, you're creating harness. So that's whatever, you know, thing you need to do to, to actually complete the action. And then you're putting it back to JSON and returning it to the client. And so this is actually a really elegant and simple way to handle these things. And one of the nice things is right here, you'll notice we're not dealing with any looping. We immediately, we push the request we have and then we wait for it to come back. And we don't have to worry about, okay, well, what if the request times out? If, if we want to, you can actually add a timeout to it, to the block, but we're just gonna block. We're gonna assume that, you know, the software on the other side knows what it's doing and it's gonna get the job done. So the benefits, you've got much better performance, way better. You've eliminated that whole HTTP stack and you've converted it to a couple network calls. It's simpler development. Like this is so much easier to deal with than uh, making HTTP requests. And, oh. Oh, okay, so, so I'm sorry, so when you say client, is that the thing that's consuming? Because th this is kind of moving to a producer-consumer model, but, but traditionally, like, the client of the API and then the server side, is that? And you built this JSON, right? So uh, if, there, if, if you don't have this book coming on the, on the client side, then you have to pass the, the URL. No, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, so, yes. So, so I guess I did skip step 10. So this is where you're connecting to the Redis server. So you're using this, you know, local host, whatever IP address you need to connect to the host. And so all of your, all this stuff is going through the Redis server, right? So, so if it's not running, I mean, you can run it locally or you can be running it somewhere remotely. You know, it, it doesn't matter as, as long as that, you know, Redis host is, is accurate. Does that, does that answer? <laughs> okay, yes, that is one of the cons to this, is there's no browser. This is purely for internal services. Um, in fact, yeah, so there's, well, I've, I've got a slide coming up on that. All right, so in fact, actually right there in our cons. So simpler development, uh, it's easier to determine load, we'll talk about that briefly, but so cons, so there's no browser support. Yeah, exactly, this isn't using JSON. So if, if you need browser support, then you have to also create a JSON API or, or just take that route. But if you're trying to create an automated, I mean, when we talk about like microservices, it's generally all automated stuff. It's, you know, someone has made this request and I need this customer information, so I, I, I make a request to the customer information service, you know. Um, but then the other con is that you can't make this public. These, these are internal only. If, if you're, Redis has no access controls, it has no real authentication. So if a user can insert a key, they can also delete all your keys. They can, you know, so this is something that you can only use for internal. And again, that's kind of why I, I focus on service-oriented architectures, that this is something for internal services. Um, so if you want to take this approach, how do, you, how do you start doing it? Well, app get install Redis server or brew install Redis, run Redis server and pip install Redis. And, and those are the three commands to get Redis up and running and, and start using it, which is again, a lot simpler than setting up an HTTP stack. Uh, oh, so server load. So that was something I mentioned earlier. Uh, I worked for F5 for a number of years and you know, our bread and butter is load balancing. And so we spent a lot of time on how do you know 
if an HTTP server is overloaded? Well, it's really difficult. You, you generally, the, the general approach is you look at response times and you say, okay, well, requests are taking you know, three times normal, so we need to start redirecting them to some other server. Or it stopped rep rep uh, replying to pings, so I guess we should take it out of circulation. Um, with Redis, you just need to know a third command, and that's list length, L len. And that'll tell you how many, how many uh, requests are, are in your queue. So if that queue length starts growing, then you know that you need to uh, spin up more you know, servers, more consumers of that queue, or, or slow down your producers. So it makes it extremely simple to do that, that type of um, performance analysis. So <laughs> what if you don't care about REST APIs? Yeah, okay, that's nice. I like service-oriented architecture. It's usually kind of someone that's operating at scale. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple other things that are nice about this pattern. Uh, it's an easy way to work around the GIL. Um, anyone, of course, that's done any serious development with Python has run into the global interpreter lock, and you can only use one core. Well, you can have that Redis server running locally, and you can pass off that uh, you know, request to external programs to, to run, uh, to ex you know, fulfill those requests, and then you, you, you're able to use all your, your cores. You can, uh, you can have a C program accepting requests, and, and you can get as, you know, as fast as you want. And you, you pay a little bit of overhead in that Redis transaction, but if you're doing a lot of work, it's, it's minuscule, it really doesn't matter. And what's great is uh, <clears throat> those APIs are, are pretty universal. There's a Redis client for just about, just about every language. Um, <clears throat> and they all pretty much look like this. You create a connection, you execute a command, and, and the commands are pretty much universally named. And so ver uh, it's actually much simpler then to develop services in other languages because you know, they, they look pretty much what you're used to in, in every other Redis client. Whereas if you try using like HTTP requests, you, know, you, you do something uh, over HTTP, it varies widely between languages. You know, trying to create a request in Java versus using requests in Python is, is completely different. And it's an easy way to take advantage of great software in other languages. One of the, the ways that I've used this is um, in Python, there's, there's really no good natural language date parser. There's, there's one module that it will handle if you give it an exact string, like October 2nd, 1995, it'll give you a date object back, date time. But if you say, I'm interested in October 12th through October 14th, you don't get anything back. Everything errors out. Java has this great piece of software called Natty, and it will handle that, and it gives you ranges. It'll say, hey, it's from this date time to this date time. Well, if you're a Python developer, how do you take advantage of that great software? Uh, what? Jython. Well, right, exactly, Jython. But then how are you communicating back to your Python? Are you running everything in Jython? Okay. But if, you, if, you're, if you're mainly using you know, a Python interpreter, I mean, you could just shell out, right? You could just create an executable, or you, know, you could use pipes, or you can set up like an RPC server. Like, there's a bunch of options, or you can set up a REST API. So that was one thing I was like, well, I know REST, maybe I should just do a REST API for Natty. Uh, well, it turned out using this was a lot easier because it was three commands. You know, it was setting up the connection, and then it was waiting for requests. Um, and, and you know, that was pretty much it. So yeah, that's the end of the talk, very quick. Um, questions, any? Uh, can you speak to the status of persistence and service goes down what happens? Yeah, okay, so yes, Persi uh, yeah, so, so you asked uh, persistence in Redis. What happens if your server crashes? And um, so by default, it'll store everything in memory but it will also flush the disk, and you can set up the interval with which it will do that. It also, as of you know, version three, I think it was actually 2.6 or 2.8, uh, it does clustering. So you can set up a bunch of, of Redis servers, they'll all you know, 
sync up, and if some if one of them goes down, you know you don't care. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, so yeah, so that's how it handles. By default, memory only, but you can flush the disk, and it'll pick up right where it left off. Yeah. So so this is really cool, but you know you're telling this as I don't have to deal with all the error conditions on the HTTP. Right. You still have to deal with them because the register could go down. Yeah. So yeah. Go down, you still have to have Right, right. Yeah, you, you do. And, and that's, that's an oversimplification. But um, it's less likely. There are fewer parts. So yeah, yeah. But it's really cool. You still have to do it. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. And that, don't copy and paste that. <laughs> that's not production code. Yes, you still you have to have error handling. Um, but one thing that's cool is if you want to add a third command, there's, um, let's see, we're doing L push. There's a BR pop L push. Uh, and so what happens is you, um, uh, in one transaction, it'll pop from a queue and push it to another queue. So if you wanted to make things more reliable uh, on the consumer side, what I was talking about is two queues. You would have an input queue, and then that would push out to result queue. Instead, what you could have is a working queue. And so a worker would, would take something from the input queue and say, OK, I'm going to handle this and it would put it onto the working queue. So now you know someone's handling this. And then when it's finished on the working queue, it would push that to result queue. But if someone, something is sticking in the wor working queue for you know, five minutes, for whatever your timeout is, then you know, OK, I need to actually hand this off to someone else. So, so you can increase the rel reliability. But yes, you still have to worry if, if the server crashes. For these two commands, it's it's oh, it's n1. It's uh, I'm sorry, it's it's o1. It's constant because it's it's a doubly linked list basically. So you're adding a, a node to the front and you're taking a node off the back. <coughs> yes, yeah, and it's very easy to use. It, a Redis dash CLI. It'll connect to your server and you do you know whatever you know l push, blah, and it it does you know. The biggest downside would um, would definitely be that it's internal only. There's no access controls. There's no authentication, really. Um, you know, there, there's yeah, like a password. You could put something in front of it, you know, like VPN. But if you've got access to the server, you've got access to everything. So you could say instead of you know L push, I'm just gonna destroy this this queue. So yeah, so this is for trusted you know clients only. That's by far the biggest. <laughs> It sounds like you're implementing your publisher consumer package. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, uh, why would you not use like a message messaging service? Um, well, this is essentially. A th this is essentially it's yes. Service, like not distributed, just a single instance. Well, if if you want to make it more complicated, yeah, you can run multiple Redis in instances, and it is distributed. Okay. Which which would address probably the concern that we would handle more errors. Hopefully, in the distributed um, system, you could. Send a message to a cluster. Yeah. Kind of I mean, have a stronger assumption that things will not fail. Right. It, and like I said, the guarantees are higher than HTTP, but right, if you're putting anything in production, you, you need to. Okay. It, there are error codes that will return. So, yes, definitely don't, don't just drop those. So, how does that code compare to if you were to use like the Redis Q library? I actually haven't used the Redis Q library. Is that is that a specific module? It's Redis Q or yeah, it's like Redis Tech Q. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure if that's just a wrapper to simplify. All yeah, the way exactly. More. It probably makes these things even easier. So yeah, so it could be even easier than that. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
I, I, I think it does. It is something that they've worked on, the, the maintainer. I would love to not give a shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's not a mind. No, no, and, and I think it, I mean, it's got C-sharp clients. So, no, it, no, are you no, talking no, about no, running no, the no, server no, on it? On Windows. The client does not matter. Sure, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm well, sure, I mean, it's I'll, like, I'll, if, I'll Google it. I'll right, Google. exactly. If you actually get, you know, if you run Python on Windows, there's always caveats. It's any open source project on Windows, there's caveats, but. <laughs> Anything? All right. Anything else? We're good? All right, thanks.